It's Thursday. It's a special edition of the Zagri Report, real and unscripted. And it is real and it is unscripted because Jeremy has no idea what we're going to talk about. And I just planted the seed in my head just a little while ago. And so why don't we just get right down to it? How are you doing, Jer? I'm okay. Yeah, let, let's let's do it. Okay, so over the course of 40 years, there has been a new constituency defined that is the constituency that is the swing voter that determines the outcome of the election. So we had Reagan Democrats in the early 1980s. I'm not going to explain each one of them. I'm, I'm going to ask people to look them up if you want to know. Uh, we moved on to yuppies, young, upwardly mobile professionals who were swing voters. From there, we uh, and we did a lot of work on this in the 90s, soccer moms. Mm -hmm. And then later on, under George W. Bush, uh, the issue then became security moms. Still the same women, still from the suburbs, but more of a focus on fear and insecurity and less on life in suburbia. Uh, we took our turn in the late 90s and uh, early millennia um, with the investor class, with NASCAR fans, with weekly Walmart shoppers. Uh, these were really defining groups as we discovered. This year, we are hearing an awful lot about double haters been a bunch of articles about them and we're here to kind of give a little bit of granularity to the concept um, but let's define it first in simplest terms the double haters are people who do not like both not either do not like both Donald Trump and Joe Biden and to be very honest with you as we see in our numbers uh, consistently most of those really intensely dislike Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. And as we've seen in other polls, uh, do not like the choice that they have this year. However, they are likely voters nonetheless. And so it all boils down to the double haters as to who's going to be elected in 2024, obviously providing it's still Donald Trump uh, versus mm. Joe Biden. And that's pretty monumental there. I don't recall that we've ever been in a situation where, you know, I've been in situations, uh, you have too, where I hate one guy. Let me see if I can hold my nose and vote for the other guy. But this time, I don't think there's any nose holding. And so I wonder, you know, you have pointed out that um, we even wonder if these likely voters are going to vote or if these likely voters, this is what we talk about without mentioning any names. This is what we talk about when we talk about third party opportunities. I think this yeah. is why no labels doesn't have any candidates, but it's still saying there's an opportunity out there. And in full disclosure, you are polling for Bobby Kennedy, and he's still polling double digits. Um, and uh, there's kind of a direct correlation, right, between his doing well among uh, double haters and, uh, uh, you know, and, and his polling numbers. What do you think about these double haters? Isn't that fascinating, I think? Oh no, it definitely is, and and you know if you if you think about it, we we have kind of alluded to it, um, in terms of I mean I everybody knows about hyperpartisanship, but I I think we understand hyperpartisanship better than any other research firm just by virtue of working with both sides and and working with all candidates, um, all types of candidates and all types of clients, and that one had to wonder whether there would be a burnout and not just a burnout in terms of voter turnout, which, which I do think is, could be, could be um, something we, we, we could face 
a possibility in November where a lot of, unlike last time, where it was record setting, um, this one could could be people are just exhausted mentally, physically, mm-hmm. and spiritually by just look at these campaigns that that mm-hmm. that Trump and, and Biden are um, are running. I call it a Balkan blood feud. That's what it is. I mean, they're they're looking to take it to to, to generational warfare, where the you know the children are going to be talking about how they hate Biden and Trump. That that's what they're doing. And so as a result, right, you have the prospect of potentially not only low turnout, but also people just saying, I can't stand both of these guys. Yeah. Get these guys the hell away from me every time. I turn on the freaking TV. Every time I turn on the radio, people are angry. The the right are are the right are foaming at the mouth. The left are foaming at the mouth. You know, do we want to live like that? So third party candidates, by virtue, have this amazing opportunity. Probably that's why there's a lot of them. We've got Kennedy. We've got Cornell West. We've got no. We've got the party no no labels, but no candidate. We've got Jill Stein back in the game. We've got the libertarian, Lars, Lars Mapstead. Now, most of those are polling way, way low, right? I mean, Mapstead, J- Jill Stein, Cornell West, and and Joe Manchin, I su- suppose, was the last potential no-labels person I saw in the polls, and none of them broke double digits or even came close. But Kennedy was the one who came out right off the bat as when he was running as a Democrat uh, around 20%. And then when he shifted to independent, maintaining that uh, in some polls slipping a little bit, but nonetheless still commanding a respectable number in a three-way race where it's not about getting 51% um, or 50 plus one vote, 50% plus one vote. But as you talked about these double haters, so what happens when we isolate the data to those who who rated Trump and and Biden both rated both of them unfavorably? Kennedy leads the pack by a long shot. So the question becomes: in this environment of 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 intensity and 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 let's just be honest, hatred. Mm-hmm. Does the camp of double haters grow or does it decrease? Now, I have to say, I don't see a situation where Trump and Biden change their tone and and hire some communication strategist to do a makeover. And all of a sudden they gain, you know, the previous success that they had. You know, recall Joe Biden in 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 2020. Uh, or even before, recall Donald Trump in 2015 and 2016, the lean, mean, fighting Donald Trump machine who who got the interest of, of non-political people, non-voters to come out and vote. And all of a sudden, a lot of people just all of a sudden discovered, I'm going to vote Republican. I'm going to vote for Trump. And, and they, they probably never would have before. I don't see that. These men, through hubris, have now, it looks like, reached nemesis. And bad things happen when you reach the state of nemesis. So does that mean the double haters grow or do they they decrease? I don't see a scenario where you have less double haters. I see a scenario where you have more double haters and who benefits from that. I'm going to support that for a bunch of reasons. One is, you know, by way of context, we're already looking at slightly more than one in five total likely voters who fall into this category of double haters. That's substantial. As you point out, it's March right now, and the campaign ads and the campaign rhetoric uh, that we're hearing and seeing right now is pitched traditionally for late October. But here we are in March, April, May, June, July, August, September. I'm doing this for a reason. September and October. You get to a point of critical mass where voters say, you know what? Both of you guys are right. I hate both of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
And I wasn't even paying attention before, but I'm, I believe both of you. And so in that sense, I'm agreeing with you that double haters are probably going to grow. And that makes this election even more troublesome. I, you know, I, I still think there's the specter of many of these double haters choosing uh, to not vote. I mean, that's what happened. Uh, there was a dip from 2012 to 2016 because uh, you, you had sort of the same thing with Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump in, in that campaign. The other thing is the who. Um, who are the double haters? It's one thing to say, all right, they, uh, they're independents. Okay, I get that. But there's double digits among Democrats, double digits among Republicans. There are double digits among Latinos, double digits among blacks. These are key constituencies for both groups. I mean, somebody's got to win over somebody. Otherwise, we're, we're right now in, in a state of stasis, right? Uh, you know, I know the polls that Trump is ahead. Trump is ahead by two, you know, by one. You know, battleground states up by 2.5, 0.6 in Pennsylvania. But it's a significant number of soft supporters and... Um, uh, and those who are genuinely undecided that are the, demand, uh, the, the dynamic that we've got to watch here. Yeah, I, I, I think I, so. I mean, when I listen to those demographic groups and there are these significant double digit um, portions with, within each cohort who, who are, are double haters, you, you just start to think of the term critical mass. At what point does it, does that grow and grow and grow and just, you know, sh shoot, um, not, not uh, into the stratosphere, but to a significant level. It's already at a significant level. And, and I mean, I, I'll just say that while that is a very likely, very possible trend, of course, being in March and, you know, going to November with all of these things you know, looming over the United States, national debt, international crises, mm -hmm. on the verge of international crises. Real issues. Real issues. Uh, you talked about the, the, the fear and security during the W campaign. Boy, that has just taken on a new toll um, in, in, uh, in terms of the political landscape. So, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a lot and, and, We've talked about black swans and, you know, black swans. I'm talking about it in the context of, of an election. You know, like what issue is going to pop up that's just going to totally change the playing field? There's always the possibility of that. That yes. happened in 2020. COVID was not only in general a black swan, but it was the black swan for the 2020 election. And there, there could be a major event that pops up that has makes us have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's going on. So in addition to being a pollster for professionally for 40 years, I'm also an entrepreneur. And so I'm going to, in a shark tank sort of way, throw out an idea, which will be my final comment. I think somebody out there listening or watching this can produce on mass bumper stickers. I'm a double hater and I vote. What do you think? Is that a good, good idea? Is it a conflict of interest uh, for me to seize upon that idea? <laughs> Probably, but hey. Uh, <laughs> I see my I see I see money in that. That's a good All idea. Right. Hey, this I'll is back good off. Story. I'll back off though. <laughs> I'll um, it's wide open out there, folks. Um, that's it. Good discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good one.